So let's begin the session. Today we will be discussing the previous year's questions, uh, pre previous year's MCQs of 2018, 19, and 20. Because you're very close to the examination now, so I thought that it might as well be a good time to revise the important topics of the last three years to just hold you on pace for the current examination. So let's begin the class. So we will begin initially with uh, 2018 questions. Continuous watery discharge from the nose after trauma is most likely a feature of CSF otoria, common colds, CSF rhinorrhea, anterior epistaxis. So kindly answer in the poll whatever you think is the right answer. Yes, so continuous watery discharge from the nose is what they have given. They have not given from the ear. If they would have given you ear, then you would have considered CSF otoria. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, continuous watery discharge can occur in common colds, but that has nothing to do with trauma. So it is not common colds. Epistaxis will present as bleeding from the nose, but this is a typical case scenario where you get clear watery kind of discharge from the nose, which is suggestive of a CSF rhinorrhea. Let's go to the next question. I'll be going quite quickly because you guys are very close to the examination. I don't want to waste a lot of time here with only ENT. I know you have all the 19 subjects to read. But just in case you need any explanation regarding a particular MCQ, please feel free to ask me in the chat box. I can describe the, or explain in detail about that particular lesion or particular topic. Which of the following is not a pre-malignant lesion or condition? Chronic hypertrophic candidiasis. Oral submucosal fibrosis, lichen planus, leukoplakia. So, which is not a pre malignant condition? It's a very simple question, but a little tricky. That whenever there is a candidiasis, is it an infective condition? Does candidiasis, is it caused by a fungal infection? Can infections be pre-malignant anytime? Obviously not. So chronic hypertrophic candidiasis cannot be a pre-malignant condition. So this option here clearly tells you that this is not a pre-malignant condition. So whenever you have any infections, bacterial, viral, fungal, most of them are not pre-malignant conditions. Now, uh, oral submucosal fibrosis definitely there is it occurs because of smoking tobacco chewing when there is transformation of the epithelium or the subepithelial space causing fibrosis this is a pre-malignant condition and leukoplakia also you know is a pre-malignant condition lichen planus is an autoimmune disorder where you get typically whitish stria in the oral mucosa or buccal mucosa and in 5 to 10 percent of the cases this can transform into malignancy so all these these three are pre-malignant conditions, but hypertrophic candidiasis is not a pre-malignant condition. Whenever we talk of infections, some viral infections like Epstein-Barr virus, Hepatitis C virus, these viral conditions can cause a particular condition that can predispose them to malignancy. So some viral infections can predispose to malignancy, but we do not call them as pre-malignant or you know, uh, conditions that will definitely lead to malignancy. So here the answer is chronic hypertrophic candidiasis. Trismus in parapharyngeal abscess is caused by spasm of which muscle? Medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid, masseter, temporalis. This is again a very common repeat question which has been asked multiple times in FMG. So what is trismus? Is it also called as lockjaw? Difficulty in opening the mouth, is it called as trismus? Yes. So this trismus or lockjaw occurs because of initial stimulation or initial involvement of the medial pterygoid muscle. So if you all remember the boundaries of the parapharyngeal space, is it bounded medially by the buccopharyngeal fascia? laterally by the mandible medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid 
posteriorly do you have the carotid sheath with its contents and it communicates to the retropharyngeal space yes so when there is an abscess in this particular space we call it as the parapharyngeal abscess and because of the involvement of the medial pterygoid muscle it will result in trismus or lockjaw later your lateral pterygoid can be involved but the first muscle to be involved in a parapharyngeal abscess is medial pterygoid so clear about this do you want me to tell the boundaries of parapharyngeal abscess or can i go to the next question if you want me to tell quickly i'll tell it in the chat box so that by that i okay i'll tell it in the next thing okay dip at 4000 hertz in pure tone audiometry indicates otosclerosis meniere's disease noise induced hearing loss age related hearing loss okay so here we are talking about a dip that is seen at 4000 hertz now here in audiograms we have two types now whenever what does x indicate air conduction or bone conduction air conduction or bone conduction symbols in audiometry yes air conduction of which ear do you all remember right and left air conduction is zero and x bone conduction symbols are lesser than greater than open bracket and close bracket are these the symbols so does x indicate air conduction curve of the left ear and zero indicate air conduction curve of the right ear yes so do you see that two air conduction graphs are given bone conduction graphs are not given but do you see typically at 4000 hertz there is a bilateral dip in the ac curve in both right and left ear so dip in the ac curve and bc curve so typically you will get a dip at 4000 hertz in the ac curve also in the bc curve of not just one ear but of both the ears this dip which is seen at 4000 hertz is called as boiler's notch and this boiler's notch is seen in a particular condition which is called as noise induced hearing loss so in noise induced hearing loss you will get a boiler's notch clear to everyone so dip at 4000 hertz is suggestive of noise induced hearing loss now in otosclerosis where will you get a dip at which frequency quickly tell me very good at 2000 hertz in which curve will you get it in the bc curve or in the ac curve this is your bc curve which is in the normal range except at 2000 hertz where you get a dip and ac curve is affected this particular condition where ac is affected bc is normal but you see a dip in the bc curve at 2000 hertz that is very 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 specific for otosclerosis in meniere's disease what type of audiogram do you get an upsloping audiogram or a downsloping audiogram in meniere's disease typically do we get low frequency hearing loss so when we get a low frequency hearing loss at lower frequency at 125 250 500 will i have more hearing loss as compared to 1k 2k 4k and 8k so will my graph be like this at lower frequency i have more hearing loss but at higher frequency my hearing is coming back to normal so is this a down sloping curve or an up sloping curve junaid uh, sorry kritika indupriya yes so this type of a graph is called as up sloping graph which is seen in meniere's disease in which condition do you get down sloping graph then in which condition do you get a graph like this where both ac and bc are affected and you see a down sloping graph yes this is typically seen in press by acuses so press by acuses typically leads to a down sloping here in uh, down sloping graph okay so clear about all this low frequency so up sloping and here you get a down sloping graph regarding the abscess parapharyngeal abscess i have one more question during that time i will tell you the boundaries of these spaces 
which of the following muscle originates from the first pharyngeal arch stapedius muscle anterior belly of digastric posterior belly of digastric stylopharynges so if you see the pharyngeal arch and their derivatives the first pharyngeal arch is responsible for mainly giving muscles of your mastication which are your muscles of mastication masseter temporalis medial pterygoid lateral pterygoid and your anterior belly of digastric so along with muscles of mastication it gives rise to anterior belly of digastric and this is supplied via the mandibular nerve the second pharyngeal arch is responsible for giving rise to muscles of facial expression along with muscles of facial expression it will give rise to posterior belly of digastric kritika tensor villi palatini tensor tympani are all first arch i am telling in brief the important muscles okay just to remember okay so that you don't have any confusion so muscles of mastication first muscles of facial expression second anterior belly of digastric from the first arch posterior belly of digastric from the second arch which is formed with the nerve of the second arch is facial nerve the nerve coming from the third arch is your glossopharyngeal nerve which supplies your stylopharyngeus muscle so glossopharyngeal nerve with the stylopharyngeus muscle and the fourth and the sixth arch will give rise to muscles of the pharyngeal and laryngeal framework so the laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles come from the fourth and sixth arch so in brief did you get an idea of what are the muscles and nerve of each embryological arch there are many other structures but if we go on discussing it will take a long time so in brief i have just discussed that so the muscle which originates from the first pharyngeal arch is anterior belly of digastric stapedius from the second arch posterior belly of digastric from the second arch and stylopharyngeus from the third arch got it cold water is not used for syringing because cold water leads to wax impaction cold water leads to foreign body impaction can cause tympanic membrane rupture it can cause vertigo by caloric stimulation very good most of you once said it absolutely right so whenever we are doing syringing to remove any foreign body or any wax from the ear you use water of body temperature which is 37 degrees centigrade if you use warm water or cold water these thermal currents will be transmitted via the tympanic membrane to the middle ear and from there to the lateral semicircular canal and stimulation of this lateral semicircular canal will result in vertigo and nystagmus which is why you do not use warm water or cold water you will use water of normal body temperature because it causes vertigo by caloric stimulation picket fence fever is seen in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis quincy laryngitis sicca croup so where do you get this hectic picket fence type of fever okay so about 50% of you have got it right so what is picket fence type of a fever you get a spike of fever then a few hours or days of normalcy and then another spike of fever resembling the fence of a garden this type of a fever is called as picket fence type of fever which is seen mainly in lateral sinus thrombosis or sigmoid sinus thrombosis so what is happening here the lateral sinus or the sigmoid sinus drains ultimately into the internal jugular vein now whenever there is thrombosis of this sigmoid sinus 
what will happen sometimes there will be release of embolus from the thrombus and once there is a remove em a thromb embolus that comes from the thrombus when it goes into the blood stream there will be a spike of fever and then there will be a normal period and again when next embolus is released you will get a spike of fever this type of fever is seen in sigmoid sinus thrombosis or lateral sinus thrombosis okay hello jamal i am also happy to see you most common symptom of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is airway obstruction headache neck swelling epistaxis so whenever we talking about nasopharyngeal carcinoma what is nasopharynx <coughs> is it the space behind the nose where it communicates with the nasopharynx and is it the space where you've got the opening of the eustachian tube which connects the tube from the nasopharynx to the middle ear yes now when i have a carcinoma which is so small like this will it present with any obstructive features like airway obstruction or eustachian tubal obstruction can it present with any obstructive features no but can it have lymphatic spread and can it go to through lymphatics into the neck when it is small because it is rich in lymphatics yes so will the initial presentation be neck swelling earliest presentation yes because of multiple lymph nodes but once the tumor becomes big like this is it causing nasal obstruction is it causing eustachian tubal obstruction if it goes and spreads superiorly can it go into the sphenoid sinus and the cavernous sinus to cause nerve palsies can it goes toward the jugular foramen and cause lower cranial nerve palsies yes so when it is bigger then it will have obstructive features but otherwise it will have mainly lymphadenopathy or your neck swelling main stay of treatment for glue ear will be radical mastoidectomy myringotomy and aeration to the middle ear temporal bone resection tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy so what is the main stay of treatment very good most of you answered absolutely right so what is glue ear is it also called as otitis media with effusion also called as secretory otitis media non separative otitis media yes yes so when there is effusion in the middle ear when you have got sterile fluid in the middle ear first and foremost after giving complete medical therapy after you have waited and watched for 3 months despite that if there is a persistent effusion in the middle ear do you want to make a hole and in the tympanic membrane and clear the effusion yes also you want to establish a aeration between the middle ear and the external auditory canal yes also do you want to treat the underlying cause which is obstructing the eustachian tube like an adenoid hypertrophy tonsillar hypertrophy dns yes but they are asking you main stay of treatment now if you do only tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy can the glue come out or the effusion come out no so first thing you are definitely the main stay will be to do myringotomy and aeration along with that you are going to treat the underlying cause now in this question they have not given you any clinical scenario of adenoid hypertrophy like dull face or elongated face pinched nose high arched palate crowding of teeth dental malocclusion they have not been given so we are not taking tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy as the main stay we are taking myringotomy and grome as the main stay got it so i think 2018 questions mostly i've covered everything now we'll go to 2019 questions i think this space is fine with everyone i don't want to do very very slowly because uh, your your time is very important at the current moment you just need to have familiarity with the last three years question so that's why i'm just getting them all at one place or for discussion just before your exams the muscle which is required to open the eustachian tube is tensor villi palatini salpingo pharyngeus tensor tympani palato pharyngeus
the eustachian tube is normally a collapsed structure so the eustachian tube has a resting volume of 0 cc if they ask you a question what is the resting volume of the eustachian tube it is zero because it is collapsed there are two muscles which will help the main muscle is tensor villi palatini along with that there is another muscle called as levator villi palatini this is accessory muscle that will help but the main muscle that will help in opening the eustachian tube is tensor villi palatini so the tensor villi palatini is the muscle that is required to open the eustachian tube a patient who recently got a denture fixed found was found to have a thrush like this it bleeds on scraping causative agent for this condition is diphtheria candida streptococcus mutans staph aureus okay so here there is a very tricky thing that they have given to you bleeds on scraping typically will a diphtheric tonsillitis also cause bleeding when you try to peel from the underlying surface yes but do you see that there is a continuous membrane like this which is extending from here to the throat yeah do you see a continuous membrane or you see irregular ulcers yes so when you see ulcers in the oral cavity and with which are whitish having a whitish base you must consider one of the most common condition because this is a commensal in your oral cavity which is your candida so candidal infection will typically be given a name oral thrush that is a indicator here and typically if they have done some dental therapy or some oral therapy after which they have developed this oral thrush you must consider candidiasis as the first line of uh first line in the differential diagnosis diphtheria typically they'll give you presentation of a child high grade fever toxic feature bull neck those nothing have been given and you don't see clear membrane there you see spots over there that is very typical of a oral thrush got it thank you candy a lady comes to the opd after a fall from scooty her vitals are stable she is having continuous clear watery discharge from the nose after two days there this is most likely a feature of csf rhinorrhea acute respiratory tract infection middle cranial fossa fracture rhinitis <laughs> so this is a question which came in 2018 question in 2019 question in 2020 also so please keep csf rhinorrhea csf otorrhea as one of the commonest topics that is being repeated in your examination in the last 3 years consistently either in june or in jan examination one of these examinations definitely you are getting this question so please mark this as a very important topic to clear i mean to read before you go to your exam so if a lady comes to the opd after a fall from scooty there is a clear watery discharge from the nose it is typical of csf rhinorrhea if there is a urti or an acute respiratory tract infection they will not have history of trauma they will have history of fever and nose block so it cannot be rhinitis cannot be but which cranial fossa fracture will cause a csf rhinorrhea anterior cranial fossa or middle cranial fossa if there has to be csf rhinorrhea yes so it is not middle but it is anterior cranial fossa fracture middle cranial fossa fractures will result in csf otorrhea not csf rhinorrhea office headache is due to inflammation of which sinus frontal maxillary ethmoidal sphenoid so what is the meaning of office headache typically will they have headache as soon as they wake up in the morning yes it's not stress headache tension headache jamal and junaid let me just explain to you now assume this is a person who has been sleeping through the night 
ओके दिस इज योर फ्रॉन्टल साइनस सो विल देर बी ग्रेविटी डिपेंडेंट अक्यूमुलेशन ऑफ सिक्रीशन वेन द पेशेंट स्लीप not gravity dependent but since the patient is in the resting position and it is in an anti gravity position will there be retention of secretions yes now as soon as the patient wakes up in the morning and sits upright is his sinus full of secretions so typically when he wakes up in the morning will he have headache yes now as the day passes by now the patient is sitting throughout the day will there be gravity dependent drainage of this sinus as a result will the sinus become free by evening yes what do we call this as where the patient wakes up with the headache in the morning and it is relieved by evening so subha subha uthte hi patient is having headache so office ko jaate waqt he is having headache so will be call it as office headache yes it is also called as periodic headache or there is a periodicity in the headache whenever there is a frontal sinusitis so office headache is due to inflammation of the frontal sinus got it everyone understood this adams apple in males is due to thyroid cartilage cricoid cartilage hyoid cartilage epiglottic cartilage so what forms the adams apple in males yes this was very easy so adams apple is due to the thyroid cartilage so if we quickly have to revise the laryngeal framework what is this butterfly shaped cartilage superiorly present what is it called as yes butterfly vertex headache and occipital headache is penoidal sinusitis okay so this butterfly shaped cartilage is called as thyroid cartilage this thyroid cartilage has two wings which meet at an angle of 90 degrees in males and 120 degrees in females and this angle which is more acute is called as adams apple below the thyroid cartilage what do you have this is your thyroid cartilage now to the inner surface of the thyroid cartilage what is attached do you get a leaf like cartilage attached to this is your epiglottis yes 